Hey, welcome to the eighth, I believe, uh, Leadership Lounge. We're very excited for our guests this week. And uh, Johnny, he's going to introduce them just in a, in a few minutes. Um, so first of all, a warm welcome uh, to you if you're watching for the first time. And for everybody else that are in here every week, you know, it's, uh, it's just uh, fantastic for, for you to join us in this lockdown edition. Um, we will start having more regular ones um, and have a set way of doing it from September. And I'll just make a quick introduction to those of you that are watching for the first time about this European Leaders Learning Community, which this is a part of, initiative out of. So it's a group of leaders here in Europe and it's initi initiated from Steve Mayers. I was a, a former leader uh, of, of Vibram Europe uh, quite some years ago now. And uh, it was on his heart to see a team develop uh, both a website but further training uh, for leaders here in Europe and to create really a community of leaders. For those of you that may have done an LTS or so on, um, there's a, a certain community that is created around it. And I think that's probably why many of us, we are still in this mission, it is because of, of relationships across the nations. Um, so just a quick introduction to this uh, whole idea. It is, we, will, we want to create um, a community where there will be a leadership um, learning across uh, both generations and nations. Um, we will go with a theme, there'll be a theme every month. And in that month, there'll be one week, there'll be a leadership um, lounge, a little bit like what we have now, but it will be according to the theme of the month. There'll be a talk, an LDX talk, it will be called as well. Uh, and there'll be engaging leadership development, like a 10 minute video talk uh, on a certain topic, uh, again, according to the, to the theme of that month. There'll be a leadership uh, kind of a, a drop-in, uh, a little bit like Zoom. I guess many of us are familiar with Zoom now, where it's possible to have more interaction and ask questions uh, to several leaders. It can be a, a little bit of a panel. I think it's going to take different shapes and form of that. And then there'll be an article. Uh, we already now have people writing articles, and you probably have seen some of them on our Facebook but from September, you will have the entire website launch where um, there'll be many different types of resources. For instance, if you're running a school and your speaker of the week or next week just suddenly dropped out and you have to find somebody quickly, there is a resource list you can go in and see, okay, is a, a, a teacher nearby, you know, that I may be able to get hold of. So it would be a place of all kinds of different resources and sharing of resources. Um, so that's kind of, you could call it a placeholder of all kinds of goodies and knowledge based when it comes to, um, yeah, different types of um, leadership resources really. Um, so we hope that you'll enjoy it and be part of it. Uh, the target audience, it is leaders in Europe and future leaders, potential leaders. So that means basically all Byromers in Europe. I know that we have uh, quite a few guests also uh, joining us from other places uh, in the world and uh, you are so warm welcome as well. But over to you, Johnny. Hi there. Um, hi everyone. Uh, we, um, we are having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, and uh, it, we can't quite track down Anna Mary. She's uh, our beloved sister, um, but it, she's in her ninth decade of life. And so uh, navigating, clicking on links and getting this to work is proving a little bit complicated. So we'll see whether we can make it work. But for, um, uh, you've just introduced the ELLC, Tova. As, at at uh, length today. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is. Uh, I hope we're not repeating our first episode of this, um, but we're we're having a few malfunctions. Um, but I want to introduce what we're going to speak about today. Um, and uh, we, um, one of the realities is that we live in a world where there's one billion Catholics in the world, and YWAM is an organization that has uh, accommodated and been a home to many Catholics over the years. But historically, we were, 
you know, God spoke to Lauren Cunningham on the West Coast of America in the 1960s when he was a member of a Pentecostal denomination. And in many ways, YWAM can attract more people who are like have that kind of worldview. And sometimes we're not so good at working with Catholics. That's simply the way it is. For many YWAMers, we wouldn't really understand how very basic, sometimes basic questions of can a Catholic be a Christian? Should we work with the Catholic Church? Um, of course, the, the, in Ireland here, Rob Clark came to Ireland in the late 80s. He was really mentored by Bruce Kluwert, who had pioneered a work among Catholics in Austria. And Rob realized that if he was going to see YWAM grow in Ireland, which at that time was majority Catholic, and if he was only going to work with Pentecostal churches, he would literally only be working with a very small number of people. And so Rob did a, an amazing job of pioneering with Bruce Kluwert in YWAM uh, a, a, a way to show how as YWAM we can really work in partnership with the Catholic Church, that we can find God deeply at work in the Catholic world. We're not the same. We're very Protestants and Catholics are very different, but but there's a way that we can work together. And what Rob did in Dublin in the 90s was to see dozens and dozens of Irish Catholic kids coming and doing DTS and getting their life transformed. And, mo and they would mobilize many of them into missions. And so this episode today is where we want um, to talk about, uh, we wanted to interview two Catholics. So far we have one, and we're not sure if Anna Mary's gonna join us. Um, but fortunately, Rami is here with Le from Lebanon. And so if Rosen is doing the tech behind the scenes, and uh, Rami, it's great to have you with us. Um, and uh, let me just give a, a quick introduction to Rami. Um, I, I don't want to say too much that you're going to say later, Rami, but Rami uh, was our student in Belfast on the DTS in 2005. He was our first Lebanese student that we kind of gave a scholarship to and he came, I picked him up at the airport and Rami, you didn't speak great English back then. Um, and <laughs> I was like, man, this guy, I hope it's going to work out. And Rami ended up staying with us for five years. He ended up being part of pioneering a work of taking forgiveness at curriculum to dozens of schools around Belfast. In 2010, he moved back to Lebanon with his wife, Rula. They now have two kids, Deborah and JD. And they are still working with YWAM, but within YWAM have developed a ministry called the Foundation of Forgiveness and Reconciliation. They've recently just been given a gift which will enable them to build a huge center in the south of Lebanon, which is very exciting. I believe you've just bought land, Rami, or in the process of it. Yes. Um, and so Rami, for I think for YWAMers, is a wonderful gift to us. Uh, he's a Catholic. Um, and he he's charismatic he hears from god and he models what it can be like to follow jesus in the in the catholic world so um rami is one of the kindest people i know he's he like all lebanese people he epitomizes hospitality um and uh he's a he's an amazing hero of mine so rami it's great to have you with us today thank you johnny thank you so much it's an honor yeah um, Rami, um, I wonder if you can start by just telling us a little bit, probably a lot of people listening will remember the Lebanese Civil War, um, but um, uh, maybe some don't. Can you just sketch for us what was your life like? What was your early life like growing up in Lebanon during the war? Um, yeah, and what was your journey? How did you come to faith? And even how did you end up joining YWAM? Yeah, sure. So. Uh... For the one who don't know, in Lebanon, we had a civil war from 1975 till 1990. So it's around 15 years uh, of really bad, really bad civil war. And uh, it damaged the country and it damaged a lot of futures of the people and especially the young people. And I was born during that time. So my most memories uh, as a childhood is being on the uh, underground basement and uh, uh, with no food, no electricity, and uh, really not even understanding actually what is happening more than just we are on a survive mode and uh, we're just seeing, like trying to, yeah, try to overcome that time. And in the 90s when everything finished, uh, it was hard for us to uh, 
to start, especially my family, like uh, live in a poverty area and uh, uh, the mix of my family, because like the like my, my dad is actually as well Syrian and my mom is Lebanese. Uh, and my dad was Muslim and my mom is Christian and when they married we we were we were denied by the bigger family the extended family they, they, they didn't accept that at that time and the community didn't accept that at that time because of the history of the civil war and the problems we have with Syria and uh, and Muslims and all that stuff so uh, so we had real few people around us and to help us and and because I started working when I was 12 years old and I had to leave school and I had to leave uh, 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 dreams and all I had to do is uh, try to provide money for my family so we can uh, live and even though I it was very young age we still had to do that uh, but praise God God is always good and God always lead us in the right direction and the way I came to face in the midst of all this at that time I was really an angry person, a really unhappy person, and I really didn't care much about anything other than uh, basically the only resource of for me to feel better is going and play football with my friends. And sometimes I don't even go home until like midnight just because I don't want to be in my house uh, and the, just the pressure that we live in. So. Uh, the reason I came to face is basically because of a group called A to J. It's a youth group. A to J means addicted to Jesus, and uh, they did like a, an event in my hometown, and we all and they invited people randomly, and I went there, uh, uh, and I saw, and they did like a festival, and they had the Brazilian team with them, and because I used to support Brazil in the World Cup, uh, it, that's why I went, and then in that place. I learned about uh, like there was songs and everything and uh, and I believe this Brazilian team was also like a YWAM team and they uh, they were sharing testimonies and also they shared a testimony of uh, uh, famous Brazilian players like the Tafarel and Jorginho and they're sharing about their love for Christ and this was the first question mark like I yes I, I grow up Catholic and I went only to the church only if we have uh, Christmas or Easter and that's it. And why this guy is actually praising God and why everyone here is more than happy than I am. And then uh, I was invited to go to a meeting. And the only reason I went to the meeting, to the youth meeting, because the girl, there was a girl who invited me. So I was like, yes, I'm scoring. But, and I went there <laughs> and... Uh, uh, and I, I sat at the back and I watched a huge group of people and there's people in the front, they're, they have guitars, they're worshiping, they're playing, they're singing, everyone is uh, praising God. And our, the first thoughts came to my mind were this is unreal. But something in the, the area, there was something significant and I didn't understand it. It just drawn me to go back there. And what was there is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to have this life. And this is where really I decided to change my life and really to follow, follow Jesus. So I gave my life in one of the meetings and I said, I want, I want, yeah, I want, I want Jesus in my life. Now, at that time, I never understood the significance of this group of people because it, yeah, I didn't, it didn't make sense to me. It didn't really occur to me that there's so many problems between the Protestant and Catholics. But this group of people, this group were people of Catholic backgrounds and Protestant backgrounds coming together and worshiping together. And that was in the 90s. And this is, was something like very weird. And it was something very new. It's like a movement starting. And, uh, and I grow, I, and, and I was in this youth group learning how to uh, live both, like, like understand both churches and live both churches and go to the Catholic church and go to the Protestant church. And because, because of this youth group, I never saw the problem between the Catholic and the Protestant till later on when I start meeting priests and, uh, and pastors and uh, how they actually, uh, yeah, mm. not judging each other, I guess, in a way, or judging the church in another way. 
Uh, but in the midst of all this, and because of A2J, and I was in this group, and A2J was really open for YWAM. So we always had YWAM teams coming and sharing testimonies. Johnny was there as well, but I guess just before I joined the team, uh, uh, we yeah. So like because of also because of this connection, I got to go and do DTS in, uh, in Northern Ireland in Belfast because of like uh, the YWAM Belfast, Johnny and Jen and and the people who and it's really changed my life and that's that's how i become a ywammer from a group of uh, a, a, a youth group that is already mixed between protestant and catholic and we don't even know that there was something significant because we didn't have a view about what's happening in the world and going to ywam and suddenly i'm going to a place like belfast where catholic like yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And Rami, I just uh, is a kind of a note. I remember this is quite a it's it's quite a good segue in a sense because I think A to J, which is where your faith really came alive. Um, a to J was actually, I think, if I remember, was set up on a school of evangelism outreach from Heidebeck in the early eighties, and Dan Bauman was on that outreach. And so, actually, it's a great example of why I'm going into a place working obviously with Catholics and helping set up a, a Christian community. Like all of the people in A to J would have been members of other churches, but they would have come together once a week as a sign of unity in the middle of the civil war. Um, and it's a, so it's a great model really for, um, yeah, for, for you. And you grew up in the civil war. You grew up, you know, seeing bombs go over your, your house. I mean, what are some of those memories of what was the civil war like for you? Yeah, like, yeah, like I like even our house got bombed, but it, like the, the 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 rocket went to the next room and it didn't really uh, we, we didn't get hurt. We just had to run down to the basement at that time. Uh, yeah, how to explain that? Fear of definitely fear. A lot of time, waking up being afraid when when the city that you live in start to be bombed by the others, uh, building hatred toward people you don't even know because you just hear everyone what they're saying. And that for me was hating the Palestinians and hating the Muslims. Uh, yeah, hunger, you know, sleeping without food, many days, many nights, begging for food. My dad maybe will go to get some food. We don't know if he'll come back, is he's alive or not. Yeah, it's... I, I, somehow I'm try, I try to block most of those memories. And mm -hmm. I guess one of the good memories I remember is when my friend, uh, it was my birthday, I was five years old. And this memory stuck in me because uh, we can't get cake. And my friend, uh, he made a cake for me from uh, yogurt and olive oils. And he puts them as like a candle, which was, he's still my best friend till now. And... Uh, but that's what we had. We didn't have much, and we tried to, yeah, survive that time in any way we can. Okay, good. Thanks, Rami. Totally. Yeah. Wow. Um, Rami, I'm I'm so pleased to meet you. This is the first encounter that uh, I have with you, and and it's just amazing hearing your story. I I love to hear how. Um, just tell us a little bit about how your call to reconciliation. How how did that come about? Yeah, I guess you're a reconciliation <laughs> agent. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, I I never like when I was in, in A to J when I was in my youth group, I always felt that there's a calling for me, but every time uh, I felt I didn't I wasn't sure was it what it is you know and every time I said like like. So many different opportunities will come up in front of me. And I say, this is good, but it's not it yet. And when I went to Belfast, and yeah, like DTS is amazing. But for me, it was amazing, but also very painful. And I was struggling with a lot of things. Because first, very painful, because I have so much wounds that God needed to heal it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I struggled a lot about living with a friend that he is a Palestinian and all 
the prejudice that I had and all the discrimination and all the things, I suddenly, like, I, like for me, I was like, oh, I love God, I love Jesus, we go do outreach, we praise the Lord, but this person, I'm not able to accept him. And it's like, it was, I was like, what's happening and why all is this? And, and the more we talk about the conflict and what happened and, and how we can change nations. And for me, I'm like, this is so hard and it's hard and hard. And, and it really uh, took me a while to actually uh, open up and able to see the person as a person. And what really hit me is when we went to uh, our outreach and our outreach was in South Africa. And we went there for different times, uh, different places, sorry. And when we were in Joburg, we, uh, we were working with uh, uh, Project, Joseph Project. It's a YWAMR that they do, uh, they, they do after, after school program for kids. And we were helping them. And one day he said, I want you to share your story. And he took me to a school. And the school was black, full of kids. And then... And he told me the reason I wanted to share the story because on this day a tragedy happened. The the police killed so many kids because they were protest protesting for their right of education. And uh, I don't know what happened. It's just at this moment my heart started pounding really bad, uh, really fast. And I shared my testimony, but I didn't feel well at all. And the second day everyone left to ministry, and I was like, I can't go. I need to stay. And uh, suddenly, all the pressure I had in me is explode, and I start really uh, speaking with God from all my heart and arguing at the same time and blaming Him and asking Him questions. Because when you speak about conflict and peace, and you come from a place like we grow up in civil war, many people died, many people suffered. And then I went to Northern Ireland, and it's the same story, and also the people who they call themselves Christians, they are doing this. And even in Lebanon, the Christians, they had a huge, uh, a huge role in the civil war. And then I was in South Africa and all the stories, what happened in Rwanda and Burundi and Bosnia and all these places. And I was like, God, where are you in all this? Why are you allowing all this to happen? And I was so vulnerable in front of God. And, and this is where it hit me. I start crying and I felt God is also heartbroken. I felt the father... Our father is broken hearted and he was saying to me, he was saying to me, I love everyone and I want everyone to be with me. And I want everyone to, 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 to experience my love. But people are using my name and destroying my image. And I'm looking for my peacemakers and I can't find them. Would you be my peacemaker? And this is, this is where I said yes. I didn't know how to do to be a peacemaker other than being in YWAM and being uh, what we're doing in YWAM uh, in Belfast. Uh, and yeah, and this is at the moment I decided that, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna go back home. I'm not, I'm not gonna go back to the ways it is. I know this is what called me, God called me for. And this is why I stayed in YWAM and I stayed specifically in Northern Ireland with Johnny mm -hmm. to really learn about all this. Yeah. Wow, what a powerful story. I'm just thinking, what a setup, you know, to put you together with a Palestinian in a room. I mean, whoever came up with that, uh, that was a setup from God, it seems. Was it you, Johnny? Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. I might have had something to do with it. Yeah, yeah we could deal with that later. But uh, I, have, I have another question for you, Romy, and that's um, now I live in Denmark. I know there's Catholics here, but I've never run in, into any of them. You know, it's a, that might be my fault, my fault, but it's it's very small percentage. But I know that you, in um, in your work, uh, probably benefited from the Catholic faith. You know, in uh, in your ministry in Lebanon, can you just tell us how has your Catholic faith helped your ministry in Lebanon? Yeah, so I guess going back to the time of a to j because this is like the transforming time for me changing my whole life one of the i guess rules or one of recommendation that a to j had is if you want to be in this group because this group is trying to bring unity you also need to be in your own church 
So I find the Catholic Church, and I had also another amazing youth leader. And every Saturday, we used to come together for two hours and do a Bible study. And then in the and and we did that for every every week on Saturday. So the Catholic Church really opened my heart and opened my mind to really like go so deep in the Bible, which is it's amazing itself. And uh, uh, where also when I was going to the A to J, I was growing into being how to become a charismatic and how to be fully understanding the Holy Spirit and 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 work from there and be like 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 the have the, the heart of evangelist where we can actually speak about jesus uh so so because i had those both in my hand it was and uh it, and because of that it was easy for me when when i when i meet a catholic that that i have a catholic background i have a youth that i can say hey i was in this youth group in this town and said, oh, I was in this youth on the ground and we connect easily. And that really helped a lot uh, in our ministry to connect with, with, with people and to really develop the, the Catholic ministry. Wow, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Rami, the, um, what, what I've seen sometimes uh, in why I'm works is that it's like Tova was saying, we na sometimes we, we naturally gravitate to working with Pentecostals or evangelicals, you know? Um, and I think a gift to you, to why I'm in Lebanon has been that you're actually Maronite Catholic uh, background. Um, so uh, where have you seen maybe like this really not, I mean, let's just be honest in the world. You've traveled to a few different countries. Where have you, without naming names, but where have you seen why I'm really miss the Catholic world? Like in just kind of, it goes over the head and they just work in one area like not to criticize but just to kind of it helps us to see where how we can do it wrong yeah i understand your question johnny it's really uh i think like when god showed me he knew that i had like because i am the mix of a lot of different things is gonna i'm, I'm gonna able to or god gonna able to open up for me many different doors and uh and I know sometimes we are biased, especially when we only hear uh, bad things about the other. That, that's I'm I'm just don't want just to speak about only the the evangelicals or the Protestants because it's going both sides. Even when you have Catholic group, they don't even want they don't interact with the with the Protestants, and because there's always this bias and prejudice that it's like we are stealing from each other people to go to the church, which is sad. Uh, and I, all I can, I, all I can really say is, from when we get people coming for outreach and be volunteer with us, and th and those people, when they, when they learn that okay, we're gonna work with a Catholic, then I learned how much, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if the word ignorance is the right word or it's more. It becomes something normal. It becomes something. They are something, and we are something. They don't. They need say like they need salvation, and they need to uh, understand that we are uh, we are also Christian. So there's lots of I guess yeah I guess the word ignorance and uh, and if I want to really pin, if 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 you want me to sh like uh, yeah most of people who come from the state or different places in Europe. If they never had this interaction with Catholic Church, it's the same, and it, it take a lot of uh, orientation and and uh, taking them in a slow path to understand that when you look to Catholics, you need to understand the Church. And mm. I guess one of the things we are also trying to teach the volunteers that come that when we speak about the Church, we don't speak about churches. We're speaking about one Church. And even we are different families and we have different tradition, it's still one church. It's the same as like normal families. They have the same name family, but they have different traditions. And we might not agree on it and we might we might judge each other, but it's the, still the same family. And and uh, yeah, I think 
it's very rare to see like people coming from the West that actually have knowledge of the Catholic Church or able to work with the Catholic Church. It's always surprising for them and and uh, it takes them a lot to able to see like what is what what does it mean to a Sikh Catholic and and realize he doesn't need salvation because he believes in Jesus as well and he loves him and he'd pray and all that other stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm thinking, uh, well, it's so true. I think it's in conversation, in dialogue, you, you find if you don't know much about the Catholic world or the Orthodox in that matter, you know, you, you feel that there's so many maybe minefields you can you can step on or you just don't know if you have, it's kind of a short memory. I think many um, evangelicals and charismatics we have, it's like, okay, we walk away from some past and and uh, and just a short memory, not really knowing. So I think you're so right that you have a yeah great advantage there in uh, and we have a lot to learn. Uh, a lot of us, I think, in order to really talk to our family members. Um, so that's just beautiful. I have another question for you, you Rami, and that's um, when it comes to yeah, what is your foundation of uh, for uh, forgiveness and reconciliation? What is the kind of a model you work out from? Um, uh, yeah, maybe there's a simple mode or a, a way of forgiveness that you work from. I know that's both some, something you work with and have studied a lot as well. Um, yeah. So. so so when we decide to do the foundation for forgiveness and reconciliation, I guess also it's when I was in YWAM Lebanon, it was really hard to, to be peacemaker in YWAM and to have this understanding, what does it mean to work with everyone and to love everyone and even to work with the Catholic Church, and especially YWAM in Lebanon, they have bad history with the Catholic Church. So we thought the first thing we were thinking, let's start something new. And uh, and I wanted to be something very forward. What, well, who we are, and what we believe. And uh, to have reconciliation, you need forgiveness. And and forgiveness will lead you towards reconciliation. And coming from a place, my own experience, how much I need to forgive a lot of people in my life, on personal level and also on national level, because of experience that I had in the civil war. I understand this is the key to move forward in our in our nation, and it's and the key to also uh, to reach the nation surrounding us. Because I believe Lebanon is is it's like a lighthouse, you know, because we are so mixed and so diverse. And if we were able to make it in Lebanon, we are able to be a model for nations around us, and hoping we're able to bring some peace to the Middle East. And you know how hard it is in the Middle East, and all the yeah, all the problems that we're facing over and over and over. Uh, and for me, forgiveness, uh, when I was in Northern Ireland, we were working with the International Forgiveness Institute and learning a lot about methods, how we can do practically work for forgiveness. Because it's, it's, we all know that we need to forgive. Mm -hmm. And we all know that's really something important. But we struggle so much with it because we don't know how we can do it. And... Uh, the things that I learned in, in, in Northern Ireland and, uh, and doing this work is that you can do some practical things that really help. For example, learn how to deal with the anger and pain, uh, how, to use, uh, how, how, how to use your pain in, in, in a constructive way instead of the destructive way, how to, have, how to look to the things in different view and allow yourself to have like a glasses that to see the lens through Jesus and see the people as people and not as demons. Because like usually when people hurt us, we don't see, as, see them anymore as a human. We dehumanize them. Mm. So when we're able to shift this eye, then we can start working on, on forgiving. And, and obviously forgiveness, it can be really fast. It can be really quick and or it can be, and or can take ages, can take years. Uh, I guess for us, forgiveness is when we don't act out of revenge and we're able, uh, we're able to live from the value and the worth of forgiveness of, or we're able to live from the image of God is taking, instead of taking revenge 
and go down to the word way and and how do it and from there you can work out the steps that you can change and our work because of the curriculum and the schools and the things i saw and, and how it impacted in in belfast i wanted to do something similar so we we started working on the forgiveness that we have from the international forgiveness institute but my wife uh, saw that it needed a lot of uh, it needed a lot of adjusting uh, to our culture first and the creativity work in it. So we uh, we restart everything and we added the concept of reconciliation and peace. Uh, and it's not anymore about forgiveness. So we have curriculums that it's more than 26 lessons for people, for kids that are in KG2 or KG3 all the way till grade 11. And they can learn they can learn this through whole the whole year of the school. And what we do, we go to the school, we teach in it. And then we go every week and every week and every week. And then there's some schools, we've been doing that for three years, and we see huge transformations in their lives. Some people, they wanted to join uh, really uh, extremist groups, and they stopped doing that, and they changed from going there to, to want to be more like working toward peace in, the, in, in their community, instead using violence as a method of peace, which is amazing. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rami, um, there's, um, we could talk more about forgiveness, but I suppose I want to I just ask a kind of a foundational question that, again, I think a lot of YWAMers would ask, um, you know, over the years we've, we've, you know, we've done a lot with forgiveness curriculum. We have now our team in Belfast is taking the, the curriculum to about 20 schools. You are obviously the, the bishop in the south of Lebanon has let you go to every school, I think, in the south of Lebanon. You know, there's a, so much we can do. But sometimes the question that YWAM is asked is, this is nice work, but what about the gospel, you know? And like, what about, are we not meant to like save people, you know? As, mm -hmm. And how do you kind of balance the fact that you're teaching, I know you teach Muslims, Syrian refugees, Palestinian refugees. Um, I know that you have been working with the former Fighters for Peace, which is people who fought in the Civil War. And some of them are Christians, but some of them are not, you know, like, how do you answer that question of, uh, as a YWAMer, like, is it okay to do this and be a YWAMer? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a question we struggled ourselves, as a, we struggled in it ourselves as well. And uh, uh, let's, uh, in, the, in the, you know, like YWAM DNA, we had one in uh, Egypt, and I was there. And also, my question was, I was asking myself if we're doing it right. And then in the DNA, we were, we were learning about all the, uh, the covenant that we have with, with God and everything that we are learning. And one of them is huge for me because it's about how to work in the society, how to work in the seven spheres or eight spheres, depends about where, where, what you're reading. But at this point, I was like, when you speak about going in the seven spheres what you are teach what you are what what you want to do how you want to change that when you go into education and you want god to transform education how you can do that when people when people if they tell them i want you to become christians so you can have a better life they will look at you and they will say you you went and killed people how you want us to be christians mm -hmm. you know what i mean like uh like there's places in the world that you need to be Christ for them so they can understand the Christ you want to preach for them. And, uh, and I believe what we're doing is really, it's, it's, it's from, it's really uh, God calling. And, and when you have someone, okay, one of the latest stories, we, we had a Muslim, his name is Rabia. And... Uh, uh, we're doing meetings, it's called like interface. So we have Muslims and Christians, we're coming together and we're learning about our, about our, our different faces, right? And this boy, he's uh, 16 years old. Uh, he, shared, he shared something amazing. He shared, when I was a kid, he was like seven years old, he had a friend and they used to play with, together on the street. And then at the first time he went to his home, the mom of, of his friend kicked him out of the house because he's Muslim. And 
and he said, this is in those meetings for the first time I understand what to be a Christian means. Because for me, I only know what happened to me when I was a kid. That they don't like us, they hate us, and they think they are better than us. So in places like that, I think we really need to be like Christ and love like Christ instead of uh, instead of being uh, uh, yeah you know there's people are task oriented and there's people are like heart oriented I think we need to to try to live out of our heart in places like that because you don't know what people experience and you can instead of really bring the good news for them you can be the bad news for them yeah. and that's that's very important yeah, I think you were saying before, we don't need to defend Christ. We need to follow him and love him, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's yeah, like, uh, that's if you want to work with the Catholics or anyone else, if you are a believer, uh, you need to love like Christ. You know, Christ doesn't need anyone to defend him. He doesn't need anyone to defend him. He just wants people to love like him. Mm. And that's it. Okay. Um, I, I have a question too that's like uh, do you think that as you say to be hard oriented I like how you put that you know in, in a way you will have to walk in the pace with people in order to be uh, hard oriented and you need to be community focused as well I guess that it's not just a quick fix and you're not just you know jumping in and it's not a hit and run thing yeah. Uh, we say in Wyvern that we are very community focused and we want to be, and I think we are to, to a certain degree. But I, I guess you also come from a very community oriented culture. Um, what, what do you think that um, would be some keys for, for all of us to learn in order to be more hard oriented, uh, both in terms of community and, and, uh, and pace? Yeah. Um, what would you say that we have to learn? in order to be more or become more heart oriented. Yeah. Uh, well, it's easy to judge the people we don't know and we don't interact mm. with them, mm. you know? And to be heart oriented is simply to decide to meet the other person where they are and just try to, instead of being like the one who want to help them, Try to be the one who need help, you know? Mm -hmm. Try to be the one who, I teach me how to, uh, who you are and what you do and why you do what you do, you know? And, and because like to love people is messy and we need to really, uh, we, we need to really go into deep of, of uh, like, like to go really deep in their hearts and what they are going through. So we need to be good listeners at first. And also we need if if we're talking about religion, for example, we should we should at least try to understand and learn more about the others and not just from what we heard, but do our own research about what's going on, you know? And uh, yeah, I guess simply for me is to learn from our from 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 yeah, from Jesus. Because Jesus for me, he was just like really open-hearted for everyone. The, the mm. way he looked to everyone, uh, it was just simple, free love, you know? And and the way he called his disciple, he just calls them from all this different background and mixed. I need, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. you need to get the dog. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what's happening inside. Just, let's just, just, yeah. Johnny, you can take from yeah. this. Yeah, take yeah. it from here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I could ask Tova what her mistakes are. That would be good. Oh, well, you could. <laughs> um, yeah. So just to kind of say um, to everyone listening, we, we were meant to have um, Anna Mary Hannon, Sister Anna Mary Hannon. She's a gem and lovely, godly woman um, and in her ninth decade of life and is, is just uh, amazing. But unfortunately, we can't get the technology to work. So she's not going to make it. But one of the questions I was going to ask um, her and maybe we, Rami can reflect on it when he comes back is for me, Anna Mary was maybe the closest and I love why I've been a wire all my life, but it's like when she joined, when we started this space, 
she was 73 years old and she came to me and she said, Johnny, I would like to join your YWAM base. You know, I'd like to join your community. My sisters, the Franciscan sisters have said, I can join. Can I join? <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, yeah. I mean, my natural reaction is always yes. Uh, and then I said, but you'll need to do a DTS. <laughs> At which point she's been a missionary for 50 years as a Franciscan sister. So it was a bit cheeky of me. Um, but she said, oh, that would be lovely, you know? And then Anna Mary did our DTS and was with us for five years. And she really modeled to us as we pioneered this base, what community living really is mm -hmm. like at a deeper level. Uh, she showed us what prayer is like at a deeper level. And I think, I don't know what you think, Tova, but sometimes it's why I'm, we do community and we do prayer, but there's so much that we yeah. can grow in, in it and learn from, I think we can learn from the Catholic world. You know, we can learn from Franciscans and, um, Definitely. Uh, yeah. I, I think if, if I could just jump in there, um, when I moved into a small community, I lived in Sweden for a while, and it was my neighbors that, um, my non-Christian neighbors, they, um, they just loved me unconditionally, and they, they out loved me, you know, I, I, I thought it should be the other way around, you know, but it was that small community there that really did something to me. I think uh, we're not always that great at community, actually, I think. And sometimes we, becomes in, we become insular as well. But, um, but in that case, there was my non-Christian neighbors that taught me about community. Um, mm. There's this great, actually, and I like to uh, advertise for that. There's a, a, a short documentary called um, Godspeed or Living Godspeed. Mm. And it's just fantastic. And it's this... Uh, a pastor, pastors, you could say, they're both theologians, uh, that moves to, to Scotland. And there they uh, move into a tiny, tiny, tiny village. And, uh, and Godspeed, sometimes we think of Godspeed, that's going very fast. But uh, they say it's the pace of being known. You know, and, uh, and I was thinking of that as Rami spoke as well, the pace of being known. So that's, that must be a, a pace of the heart as well, that uh, Jesus, he walked everywhere, you know. Um, uh, so, so it was in that little tiny village that these people from the States that they mm. moved into, that they learned about community and, uh, and also to embrace a community and let the, the community embrace them. So they said themselves that they, they learned much more from the community than they had to teach them. So I think we have so much to learn and I would love to hear sister and Mary another part and yeah. try to get her in another time as well. We're here in another time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that she reminds me of um, uh, is this G.K. Chesterton was a Catholic writer 100 years ago, and he said about St. Francis of Assisi, he said, St. Francis walked the world as the pardon of God. Mm. Um, and I think in many ways, Rami, I think what you're doing in Lebanon, in many ways, you're walking a, a world as the pardon of God. Like, you know, you're saying about this Muslim kid, like you couldn't really tell him about Jesus because the only Christians he knew had kind of thrown him out of their house. So you have to kind of, you have to get him pre evangelized You know, you have to, first of all, we have to just love him. Um, and I, I'm just wondering even, Rami, some of your history in YWAM and Belfast and you've been to conferences in Europe and also in Lebanon, like who are some of those YWAM leaders that have influenced you in your journey, you know, as a leader, and what was it about them that, that you learned from? <laughs> You're really asking that question? <laughs> you don't have to say me. <laughs> I wasn't leading that way. But. Yeah, well, to be honest, when I was in Europe, honestly, it's like, it's like why on Belfast is the most place being impacted. I don't think I was really able to go many places when I, at that time. I think I like, uh, especially Lebanese and getting visa to travel, it's not easy. So I don't think we really, I went, I met many leaders in Europe. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, I saw it, I can't remember. No, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Even in Lebanon, like you've worked with Jihad, I know is the leader of YWAM in Lebanon. And 
I guess this is a kind of a leadership. Oh, okay, okay. Where, You're talking generally in YWAM, yeah, not only in Europe. Yeah, 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 yeah sorry. Yeah, yeah. Generally, and what are some of those strengths and characteristics that they had that you really learned from? Yeah, so, okay, yeah, you said jihad. Jihad, well, his name is not the same as who he is. That's the first thing you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> He's just one of the most gentle, amazing heart that he loved Christ so much. and uh and the way he leads always that he always looking for uh way, looking to really know that this is what god wants before moving anything further and his heart for kids he actually now the leader of the king's kids in middle east and uh and his heart for kids is just amazing i cannot explain and every any time that we are together, we're sitting and we're praying or we're meeting. It's just, uh, it's just how almost he humbles himself, even though if he he's do he do crazy things like he do a lot of work. He, like him and my wife, just started the uh, the school for refugees, and they've been it's been running now for seven years. They had over. That he have a church over a hundred person, and he's also have the whole King's Kids on his back and the Middle East King's Kids and pioneering more King's Kids work in the Middle East, and and probably you will not even hear, hear hear his name, because he's just so humble and he just want to do what God is telling him to do and not really, uh, yeah, not really to make himself famous. Uh, other leader is also uh, Janine. She is in Jordan right now. And I love her so much, and uh, I see in her like a strong woman that that she have so so she have a big heart for peace, big heart for Christ, and she chose the worst places to live in. I don't know why, even worse than the places that we live in. <laughs> so, and and uh, uh, yeah, and we had so many conversations with her, and she's just an incur she's just incredible powerful woman but she's so encouraging in everything mm -hmm. that she do and she encouraged me a lot uh through the years especially for the past two years and it's been amazing to really know her and really be, be with her mm -hmm. yeah um can i just ask one more question while we're on i just don't want us to lose the story about mm -hmm. this building uh rami can you tell us about this Miracle that you've seen happen of provision of money for your project? Yeah, so uh, it's amazing, it's crazy because, like, now in, in the hearts of everything, we are, we are, we get a donation from, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys heard of Tear Fund. Tear Fund is like a, like a Christian organization that funds like different people, and they've been really helping us in so many different uh, uh, pro, uh, ministries that we're doing. And uh, many times I sat with them and they always asked me, what is your biggest dream? And I said, like, I want a peace center to shine in Lebanon, you know? Mm. And what happened, uh, they actually, someone like passed away and they want to, and he wants to donate something to um, a memorial of behalf is his wife. And, uh, they they give him more than 10 projects and one of them was ours and like with god he, they chose in the end they decide they they chose our uh, our peace center and they're funding our peace center now the fund that is coming is not like johnny saying it's gonna be like a huge building but it's like the, it's we're gonna have the foundation from there we are able to purchase the land. It's amazing land. It's in the middle of everywhere. It's accessible from every area, and we can really reach everyone. And it's beautiful in the in the midst of the mountain, not too hot. So when people come to us, they're not gonna feel hot anymore, Johnny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, the dream is to train peacemakers in our Catholic Church, in our Protestant Church, in the Middle East, and for them to have opportunities to to learn it and practice it and we have we have a ton of work here in the middle east so they're going to get lots of practice you, you want you want dts <laughs> outreach teams second level outreach teams all of them <laughs> okay. okay yeah i just want to add something before I, i'm sure you guys pro, i'm not sure if you have a question for me but there's one thing coming to my mind for us to really have the door opening in the catholic church it's not just because i'm catholic it's because 
I found, I found the man of peace in the Catholic Church. And going back about leaders in uh, like this priest, Father Walid, he's just an amazing man. I cannot explain to him. Uh, my friend Walter, he says, he redeemed my view to the priests because like, 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 like how, much, how much he serve us all the time without even requesting anything. And he just said, please come, let my youth learn about Christ. And he opened the door for us to be in the, with the bishop, to be with the whole area. And because he loved Christ and he wants people to love him. And when you find, always look for the man of peace because he's the key for any community and he's the key for any ministry to grow and really to, he will be the, the, the foundation of the bridge building that we are looking, we are working with. So, yeah. Wow. Ravi, there is a question we ask every week, and and you may have picked it off because if we sent you the question ahead of time, um, maybe you thought that we would forget it, but we haven't. Uh, we ask, uh, what is a big mistake that you have made in your yeah. time of ministry, and something that we also can learn from, maybe? Yeah, you cannot do it on your own. Mm. So when we were trying to do the foundation for forgiveness and reconciliation. I thought I can do it on my own and leave YWAM mm. or just be like YWAM, but not really connected to YWAM. Mm. I guess because at that time I was like, I wasn't able to get YWAM in, in Middle East or YWAM in Lebanon to understand the God calling we have, have for us. But that was the biggest mistake. We end up doing two years and, and yes, we were doing ministry, but we felt so we felt we are not a community. We felt there's something missing. Mm -hmm. And then when we reconnected back to YWAM and we were connected really good, really strong, I felt like, yeah, God, like that was a mistake. We, sh we shouldn't try to do it by ourselves. Even if the community don't agree with us, we still are one community, one family. And this is the beauty of YWAM DNA that we have, mm -hmm. that we are so diverse, but we are so supportive to each other, even if we don't understand each other, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. For everybody out there, put up your hand if you have tried on your own. Yeah, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. I think that's a, that's a quite common one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's a good, good lesson. Yeah. Rami, are you reading any books lately in the last little while? What, what, we ask that question as well every, every time. Um, yeah. You were, you, well, you really were studying. So uh, Rula, she's doing her master's in uh, uh, peace building. And, uh, and she's getting great articles, a lot of articles. And I'm reading with her some of the articles. One of them is for a man, he's a French, his name is Golton. And he's talking about theory of uh, uh, conflict resolution. And one of them, it's, uh, it's called the hourglass. And uh, Galton, he have so he have so many articles and books and researches about how to work in places of conflict, and he have different theories. But I love this theory because the hourglass it show you how you can work from the bottom to the top to change your community, or from the top to the bottom how to change community, or be in the middle and be Im impacting both sides at the same time. And I I, I look at that and say like. And I think about Jesus, and I think like this is what Jesus did. He was he was in the middle where he was uh, like really impacting the Pharisees and and the authorities, and also impacting the the vulnerable at the same time, and and loving them and all that stuff. And I feel like to really do a change is this is like really good model like for us to to do it. And if I want to recommend a book that Rola loves so much, it's called The Moral Imagination by John Paul Lederach. I start also reading, uh, I'm a slow reader, so it, when I read a book, it takes a long, long time. But I love that the way he speak about, speak, speak about peace building, it's, it's not set stones. You cannot, mm -hmm. It's not the same. You cannot do it everywhere is the same. You need to imagine in every place and use your creativity and imagination to able to really bring peace because there's nothing is the same as the other place. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's good, Rami. Thank you. Um, well, you know, I think there's a lot we could ask you. There's more, I mean, when it comes to the issue of working in the Catholic world, 
there's so many questions that many YWAMers would have, but we, in this particular episode, we didn't want to get bogged into theology and what do you think about the Pope or communion or Eucharist or, you know, um, we just wanted to hear from a Catholic with a vibrant faith that can teach many Protestant or evangelical charismatics like Tova and myself, how we can be more engaging in the Catholic world. And, uh, so I want to thank you, Rami, for being a great model for us uh, mm -hmm. and um, if, if, yeah, showing us how to live life. I know on our DTS here in Ross Trevor last year, we had Lana, one of the young people, so Rami disciples, part of, well, he's part of this, this Catholic church in the local area of Sidon in the south of Lebanon. And there's a whole bunch of young people that kind of are part of this youth program with Father Walid and Rami and Rula really helped to disciple them. And, I remember meeting Father Walid when I was in Lebanon last time and, you know, we had this one-to-one -one and he said, okay, shall I, I'll give you Lana, you know, you can have this. And if it goes well, I'll give you, I'll send more young Lebanese people. So, you know, it looks like we might have more Lebanese Catholics coming to do our schools, you know? And uh, I think there's just an opportunity, probably every YWAM base in Europe could be creating space uh, for Catholic, but you need to befriend priests in order to meet them. You need to get to know people. You need to start to learn the language. Bruce Kluwer always says the Catholic world is like, it's like moving into another culture. You have to learn the culture. So um, Rami, thanks for spending time with us and, and talking. Is there any final thing you want to say? No, it's really an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if I want to say something, please pray for Lebanon a lot. We are really facing a huge disaster we're estimating that we might go and like uh like i don't know like when when a country that there's a hunger that people are not able to provide food we are mm. arriving to a level that is that this bad because of our economics so please pray for us that we're able to withstand this hardship mm. and yeah i keep you posted more johnny about what's going on and we're trying to see how we can help more families that we work with them and we love them, but also they need medication and food and we're trying to see what we could do in the future. Mm -hmm. Especially like now it's really bad, really crazy, like what's happening in Lebanon, especially from the economic crisis that we are living in. Okay. Yeah, well, it'd be good to pray for you. Um, I think we as a base are gonna pray tomorrow uh, for Lebanon. Um, I encourage us around Europe. Let's hold mm. the Middle East up. There's yeah. significant things happening south of Lebanon <laughs> that you might know if you go to your news. Um, and there's also significant things in the in Lebanon. And it's a fragile country, and it needs God to uh, bring in His kingdom there. So, thank you, Rami. Uh, yeah. And I guess Tova and I. This is our last one of these for um, a while. We're not sure. This is Deborah. <laughs> uh, um, this is our last one. Is she going? This, where are you, Deborah? Say hi. Hi. Yeah. Hey, good to meet you. <laughs> um, this is our last one of these for uh, a while, Tova. And I guess we'll just post when we next do another one of these. Yes. And also to say for those that are sick of looking at our faces, uh, not you, Rami, but Johnny and I, we will also bring some uh, new people in. Uh, there will be different hosts, uh, but I think uh, we will stick around somehow. Um, and updates will come on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, for following this journey the last eight weeks, I think. And uh, go back and watch some of the past videos or show them to your base or team um if they're good ones and uh i think this was a great episode it was great to talk to a young lebanese christian who's about to build a peace center in the south of lebanon yeah. um and uh yeah we love rami we love rula and uh your work there so thanks everyone thanks to rosen who's behind the scenes and rosen i think you can take us off the air now so bye everyone